Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Abdu, for that very flowery uh, introduction. I need to meet that person you are describing. I want to thank the SIPE family for the, remembering me and inviting me to join you this afternoon at this uh, session. So as Abdu said, it's probably good morning for some of you. It's good evening for some of you. It is good night. I don't know what time it is. I'm really happy that we could all meet here today during this inaugural conference of the Free Enterprise and Democracy Network. I'm greatly honored to be your keynote speaker and to be a part of this global network of business and think tank leaders who are committed to coming together to exchange ideas and to make the case for democratic and prosperous societies. This conference comes at a time when the governments across the globe are faced with overwhelming and competing challenges as they continue to navigate the far-reaching impacts of the global pandemic, COVID-19. Therefore, the conference's focus on successful transitions, economic recovery, and democratic renewal is very appropriate and pertinent for our current times. I have been requested to speak about markets and democracy as reinforcing pillars during transition and recovery. I will begin by quoting the words of a renowned economist and former governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, who aptly put it that democracy and free enterprise are usually found together. And it is hard to think of a flourishing democracy that is not a market economy. When we refer to free enterprise or the free market, we usually denote an economy where the market determines prices products and services and commercial activities are primarily regulated through private measures. Free markets are defined by private property rights, voluntary contracts, and competitive bidding for goods and services in the marketplace. Therefore, free markets and the free enterprise is a very, very powerful and transformative force for human advancement, both socioeconomically and politically. In Kenya, for instance, we can, uh, what can we say then is the role of government in enabling a free market economy and ensuring a sustainable transition and recovery? Indeed, the state has a role through the constitution, laws and other methods to provide legitimacy for the economic system. Thus, though essentially and preferably peripheral sometimes, or many people would wish, the role of the state is central to the free market economy. Certainly, there is a fundamental commonality between democracy and free enterprise, as no matter the outcomes of individuals, both guarantee participation to all through collective choice or individual choice, whether by the electorate or the marketplace, which determines success. However, as we all know, resident within these similarities are considerable differences. Democracy treats individuals as equal, Free enterprise, however, empowers individuals based on their enterprise. This brings to bear an inherent tension between the systems that requires a delicate balance sometimes. The government plays a critical role in maintaining this balance by doing those things which essentially only the government can do through establish appropriate legislative, judicial, and policy mechanisms and generally ensuring an enabling environment for free enterprises to function. When we look at the role of the state in free markets through the constitution and laws, Kenya is one of the most progressive countries in Africa, politically, economically, and socially. This bold outlook has made it possible for us to make a very forward looking and significant reforms in our political and socioeconomic arenas which have greatly contributed to sustained economic growth, social development, and political stability gains over the past decades. In 2010, we marshaled in a new political and economic governance system with the passage of a new constitution. This constitution made a key number of changes designed to create a more decentralized political system and a people-driven economy. Some notable aspects of our constitution include 
more emphasis on sovereignty as being exercised by the people through democratically elected representatives, the strengthening of the separation of powers between the three arms of government, the executive, legislature, and, ju and judiciary at the national level. The introduction of a devolved government with the establishment of a new system of 47 local counties, which replaced eight provinces and 46 districts. The introduction of a bicameral, uh, bicameral legislative house by creating an upper house in the parliament, the Senate, where county governments have equal representation and the introduction of a constitutionally tenured judiciary and electoral body. Most importantly, there will, we have an improved bill of rights that recognizes socioeconomic needs of Kenyan citizens uh, that uh, within this new bill of rights. So it's an expanded uh, bill of rights. This new constitutional dispensation, which has been lauded as one of the more progressive ones worldwide, has allowed the country to make the requisite reforms in all spheres of life, including political and economic. We might therefore ask, what is the impact of this new constitutional order on free enterprise? Ladies and gentlemen, as a result, Kenya's performance in legislative and regulatory reforms has been impressive. The Kenyan government continues to actively take measures to implement reform towards improvement of the business environment, and the promotion of a true market economy. These reforms have inspired a remodeling and re-engineering of business processes with enhanced positive implications for free enterprise in Kenya. We have implemented significant law reforms, including key, uh, key business regulatory reforms, such as the modernization of the Companies Act, the creation and support for business in, uh, through the Business Insolvency Act, and the Business Service Registration Act, among others. In addition, some of the key areas where we have seen a positive transformation include the country's competition framework, modernization and streamlining of tax administration, and simplification of business licenses and permits. And we continue uh, to evolve on this journey. We have removed complexity and bureaucracy from property registration, we have improved access to credit and enhanced protection of minority investors, among other changes. As a further measure towards the free market, one of the key strategies of the government of Kenya is transformation through privatization. To enhance this, the government has addressed previous constraints to privatization by fully establishing and operationalizing the institutional mechanisms required to enable a structured and seamless privatization of selected commercial public enterprise. Uh, enterprises. A clear indicator of the considerable progress that we have made as a country in the creation of an enabling environment for enterprise is our current doing business ranking a 50th position worldwide, which is a significant improvement from a ranking of 109 in 2010. Further, Kenya ranks in the third position as the most improved globally in the last two years and has been among the top 10 most reformed countries globally in the last four years. What does all this say for our public-private dialogue, which are the hallmarks of enterprise uh, development and the advancement of economic policy reforms? As you may well imagine, Kenya has been able to achieve these expansive business reforms through a committed, sustained, and action-oriented dialogue with our private sector and civil society thought leaders and actors. As a government, we are acutely aware that transformative and lasting change cannot be achieved without strategic collaborations and partnership with those outside of the public sphere. Through sustained public-private dialogue mechanisms, the private sector has been and continues to be a strategic partner of the government in the expansion of trade and investment and the creation of markets for Kenyan goods and services. Most significantly in our development blueprint for the country, we have fully taken cognizance of the critical contribution of the public-private collaborators towards the realization of economic growth development and the overall well-being and prosperity for our citizens. As we look forward ahead, we, what are some of, therefore, our efforts towards transition and recovery during this COVID-19 pandemic? 
Ladies and gentlemen, our economy, just like all others across the globe, has been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. During the period between 2015 and 2019, our economic growth averaged 5.7%, making it one of the fastest growing economies in Sub-Saharan Africa. Through the years, the performance of the economy has been boosted by a stable macroeconomic environment, positive investor confidence, and resilient services sector. The COVID-19 shock has hit Kenya's economy hard through supply and demand shocks on both the external and domestic fronts and caused activity to slow down sharply in 2020, where we estimated that our you know, real our gross domestic product uh, grew by you know, much less than 1%. Agricultural output grew robustly. Manufacturing and many services subsectors i.g. tourism and education was severely uh, disrupted. Nevertheless, moving into 2021, a significant economic recovery has been underway, although it remains uneven across sectors, with some such as tourism still remaining under severe pressure with uncertainty over the overall outlook. The Kenya government has been very, very consistent in and been very proactive in responding to these challenges. In close collaboration with the private sector, the government has instituted a recovery strategy, which includes fiscal measures as well as social welfare programs. Additionally, we have also instituted further reforms that help advance the government's inclusive growth agenda. In our economic stimulus and post-COVID-19 recovery strategy, the government has set aside more than $214 million, uh, which is about 23 billion shillings in the financial year 2021-2022, to the objective of cushioning vulnerable citizens and businesses affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's not all, that's just what we've done in this, uh, you know, uh, in this financial year. The funds are earmarked for employment creation and enhancing liquidity to business, including tax cuts, expediting value-added tax refunds and measures to increase access to affordable credit. Efforts will also be directed towards improving agriculture and food security and for the recruitment of health workers, amongst other measures. This is a continuation of our economic stimulus program, which was set in motion in April 2020, following the announcement of the first case of COVID-19 in the country. These measures continue to make significant, uh, significant difference and have been instrumental in ensuring that our private sector remains operational and is able to embark on the path to recovery. But I must also add that these measures were arrived at by, by the government in consultation with the private sector and, uh, and all the different business organizations, including the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. For us, the impact of all these targeted state interventions will go to show that indeed, in order to maintain desired economic growth trajectory, the government has a responsibility and a role to play in the continuity of a free market economy, particularly during challenging, uncertain, and unprecedented times. It further also underlines the point that when government does what, is, what it is good at, there can be a win-win outcome between the state and the private enterprise. And the reorganization and the resilience uh, that we are seeing in the business community and in our enterprises is a testament to this fact. Therefore, as I conclude, allow me to reiterate that private sector engagement in policy development is a continuous and reciprocal process where both the government and the private sector and other non-state actors derive benefits by leveraging the collaborations and partnership from public-private dialogue processes and initiatives. Further from this, it is quite clear that markets and democracy go together. The ability to uh, participate in policy making is really akin to the ability to participate in decision, uh, in decision making in the context of electoral, uh, electoral matters. Free markets can therefore cannot exist without the full participation of private citizens in the governance of their affairs. 
accordingly. And although the boundaries between the private and the public and, uh, spheres are always contested and sometimes always shifting, the market, the market ideal and the democratic ideal must coexist and reinforce each other if, if either is to flourish. And we credit ourselves with our democratic uh, credentials and it is what we credit our success as a country to. Promoting that coexistence and mutual reinforcement is best accomplished by focusing efforts where the two ideals converge, complement and balance each other's roles. Finally, to this endeavor, may I commend this network and its affiliates on this very important inaugural conference. And may I urge all of us and all the 54 members of the SIP affiliated free enterprise and democracy network spread across 38 countries to continue in this worthwhile and transformational agenda and to bring more like-minded individuals and institutions on board. It is only through such engagements with government that we are able to continue shaping public policy towards the advancement of free enterprise for global prosperity. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to join you and I wish you the most fruitful deliberations. Asante sana, which is thank you, Kiswahili. Thank you.